Today's uh, scripture reading is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. I'll be reading from New King James Version. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as through the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not Remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who know restraints will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but the pleasure in unrighteousness. After last week's Easter Sunday, message we return to our second thessalonians and now we begin with chapter two tonight years ago in the country that i come from in fact it was just shortly after the second world war the country was freed and had independence from japanese occupation but that happiness of um, being an independent country did not last very long in 1950, some of you might know that the Korean War broke out and the war basically ravaged through the whole country and many people suffered from that war and many people died. But there's even longer lasting damage that was done to the people of Korea and that is the separation of many families. Now, after the war, they put in basically uh, fences along the country um, around about 38th parallel north um, latitude and people could not cross the border and some of them had just gone to work in the morning wanting to find out that there was a border erected between their workplace and their home and they could not go home and there were many people who were separated because of that permanently and many of them, the you know, vast majority of them still have lived their lives separated from each other and many of them died without seeing their loved, loving families for the rest of their lives. And I know that because my grandfather was one such victim and um, he never saw the, the, his you know, family for the rest of his life until he passed away in, in this country, in Australia. It's a heartbreaking story. But from time to time, what's really fascinating is that the governments, um, for whatever reason, have actually tried to allow these families to be reunited for a short time. Sometimes they run these campaigns where these families are brought together. They do some research beforehand to make sure that they are indeed the lost families. And they are arranged to meet with each other uh, in a a given location only for a short time, usually two or three days at the most. And then they spend those days, very short time, 
uh, in that reunion of uh, the family members and their children, um, and then they catch up with their stories. But that's a very short-lived, joyous, joyous um, moment because they have to go back to their country, north to south. Some reunions in this world may last a little longer. Now that particular reunion that I told you about is a very emotional time that they spend, but still they cannot be together. In this world, in a sense, when people meet and separate from each other, we may come back together and have some moments of reunion, but there is no permanent or eternal reunion in this world. Even as Christians, we know that we spend some time together in this world, but we are separated from each other for you know, other reasons. And sometimes through death. In a place called Catacomb in Rome, the underground network of um, you know, caves where Christians used to hide and they would bury their dead in that underground cave system. They often sung about, sang about the sorrows of parting from each other because of death. And yet at the same time, they wrote about the future prospect of reunion with these deceased Christians. They may be dead now, but we will meet again. In many of those tomb places or tombstones, you'll often find writings that say something to the effect of, we will meet again. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Paul mentions that very moment of reunion. This is not a reunion that will last for a few days. This is not even something that will last for some years, but not eternally. But this is eternal reunion. Now, brethren, coming concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. This is when Christians are all gathered to Christ who is returning in the air. When the Lord comes with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet, as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 last week, and even 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, part of which we have just read as responsorial, those scripture texts tell us that when the Lord comes again in the air, all Christians are taken up, raptured up, to meet with the Lord, and we shall be with him forever. And not only that will we be with him forever, but we will be with each other forever. This is the gathering of Christians to our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are gathered together to him, we shall be together forever from that moment onwards. So this has to be the most joyous time. In fact, this is the climax of the human history. There has never been anything like this. When God took Enoch alive without seeing death before the flood, that was a kind of preview of what it might be like when we are taken up alive, for those who are alive when the Lord Jesus comes in the air. Even for those who are dead, they will be transformed, they'll be brought out, their bodies will be brought out of the graves, and then their souls will be reunited with them, and then they will be with the Lord with the glorified immortal bodies. So this is, in fact, the most supernatural miracle that God will do in human history, arguably, and this will be the climax of our history. In fact, this is close to the culmination of the human history because this will mark the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the grand finale to the, the orchestra, um, to, to the concerto, concerto of God that God has written for this world. Shortly after this, there will be great tribulation, only for a short seven years. And then this world will be no more. And God will rule, the Lord will rule over a thousand years, millennium over his millennium kingdom. And then even after that, this world which we know of 
will not in existence any longer, that we will be moved to eternal heaven and those who are unbelieving will be going to eternal hell. And we've seen the timeline a couple of weeks ago. So Paul is now talking about the coming of our Lord and the gathering of Christians together to him, which has to be the happiest occasion in human history for Christians, and we know that. But there was a great problem for Thessalonian church. And the question was this, have we missed that? Has Jesus come already? Has he taken up the church? And the reason why they had that confusion was because they were going through some severe persecution. Because Paul, based on the text, Paul had already taught them about the end times. And his teaching, his message was that the tribulation will come, yes, but before the tribulation there will be rapture. So churches will be taken up and will be gathered together to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the great persecution will happen in this world. But for this young church, the persecution was very heavy and severe that they thought, some of them at least thought, that the persecution had started and possibly they missed the rapture. It looks like if you can also I look at verse 2, some people might have come and taught them that false teaching. He says, by word, um, verbally, and also by letter. Maybe some people have written some letters to them saying that Jesus had already come and we missed the rapture. So they were concerned. If you miss the rapture, then, then what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to those people who are dead in Christ? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago as we went through chapter 1 a little bit. So that was the big problem that they had. And Paul is now trying to comfort them and giving them very accurate understanding of the end times. Now, you have to understand that this letter is somewhat very short. And even uh, verse 1 to 12, if you really want to unpack what's written here, we have to uh, look at other scriptures and bring in some information from other places in the Bible to make the story complete. And that's because a lot of details of the end times are not found in this text. Why? Because Paul is not giving them some kind of comprehensive lecture about the eschatology or end times. He's being more pastoral here. He's not giving them kind of doctrinal treaties about the end times. He's simply comforting them and trying to encourage them and giving them the correct understanding. And he's not giving them all the details. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because they are young church. Now, you don't want to inundate young churches and young Christians with all these details that they do not need to hear just yet. And you'd understand that if you have young Christian um, that you are discipling or helping, um, you can't simply drop the bombshell of all the details of doctrines and theology to them at one go. It takes time. You release information slowly and gradually as much as they can understand. It's just like feeding little babies. You can't expect a little newborn baby to have steaks or some hard food. No, they need to be fed with milk and then soft food and then gradually they can digest and eat some solid food after some time. So Paul is now giving them the teaching that is just right for them. Just right amount of um, information, just, just enough information so that they have no confusion, so that they are not deceived, they can discern what is right and what is wrong, but at the same time, not every detail about the end times. So, we have to understand that. And at the same time, our approach tonight will be not so much to look at comprehensive um, timeline or series of events that will take place in the end times that will take much more time than just one sermon, but rather, just as what Paul did to them, we are going to have a look at what is found in this text and just walking from this text and find out um, the kind of teaching that Paul gave to them, uh, which we can also receive from this text. And also, we want to have a look at what makes them um, secure. You know, what would give them, what would, what, would have, um, what would have given them 
peace and security in their hearts and in their minds, especially considering the persecution that they were going through at the time. It was a very difficult time, and they were comforted, no doubt. And how did that happen? And this is what our focus will be today. And the key phrase that I would like you to, I, I would like you to keep in mind is, the, is found in first verse, the concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So coming of Jesus and our gathering to him. When the Lord comes, Christians will be gathered to him. But let's have a look at the text, and I'll give you some um, explanations as we go through and bring it all together towards the end. The Paul says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, verse 2, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, do not be confused. Do not be deceived. Some people might have told you that Christ has already come, but he hasn't come yet. So don't be deceived, don't be troubled as if the day of Christ had come. His day has not come. And that would have given them some sigh of relief. The Lord hasn't come yet. So we don't need to worry about that question. And then Paul gives them the reason why he says that in verse 3 and following verses. Now verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, because that day, day of the Lord, the Lord's coming, will not come, first of all, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, which is the son of perdition. And then verse 4 describes who he is, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he's, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, whoever this is, this is the one who will say that he is God. Of course, we will see that this is basically the Antichrist, the Antichrist or Antichrist with capital A, the very figure, the very human being, the person who will say that he is God and he will sit in the temple. And because of these texts, many um, scholars um, concerning eschatology say that there will be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. It has to be in Jerusalem because that's where the temple is built, and it's not there now. But somehow, that old site for the temple will be used to build the temple in the future. And when the temple is built, it is not Christ, it is not God, but it is this Antichrist who will sit in the temple and say that he is God and demand he will demand that the world worship him. So this is the Antichrist. But look at this in verse 3. Unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. In other words, this man of sin or the Antichrist is not revealed yet. It is covered yet. It is covered for now and, and we don't know who that is. And even in our time, 2000, almost 2,000 years later, after this letter was written, we don't know who that might be. I mean, there was a lot of um, speculations and theories as to who this might have been in the past. Um, some said the Pope, some said um, Antiochus Epiphanes, some who persecuted Christians and Jews alike uh, many centuries ago. Um, and even as late as in the 20th century, someone said Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. But they may have some common elements with this Antichrist in the Bible, but they did not fit all the descriptions about the Antichrist. And they did things that were in spirit of the things that the Antichrist would do, such as persecuting Christians and Jews and killing so many people, um, being very brutal and ruling with power and might. But there are still see, other things that the Antichrist will do, even some miraculous things in the future, which they didn't. So they may have been some shadows of the Antichrist, or you can say Antichrists with small a, because there is the spirit of Antichrists, or Antichrist, who do the things that are against God or against Christ. But the true, the final Antichrist is yet to come, and he is not revealed yet. So Paul says, he's not revealed yet, and he says also, the falling away has not happened. 
Now, what is the falling away? The falling away um, is basically an event. Um, if you look at this text and if you do some study of the original text and the context and all that, um, falling away is not just a generic description of any, um, anything that's happening. It, it's rather, yes, it describes what's happening, which is falling away from God, but this is also uh, an event where this will take place. So there will be some kind of falling away of the people from God, um, publicly denouncing God and denying God and refusing and rejecting God, and people will simply um, choose to walk away from God. And, and instead of worshipping God, they will worship the Antichrist, which we read in verse 4. And that hasn't happened yet. And even in our time, the Antichrist has not been revealed yet. And still, you know, we don't see things described in verse 4 now. There's no one who kind of says on a global scale that I am God and sits on the temple um, showing himself that he is God. So we can be comforted just, just as they were comforted knowing that this hasn't happened yet and the Lord hasn't come yet. Because before he comes, this has to take place. Now, at the same time, if you look at the timeline, just to give you a little bit of clarity, this falling away and the emerging of the Antichrist actually, actually takes place during the seven years of tribulation. So we saw the timeline before, the rapture happens, and then the seven years of great tribulation begins. And about halfway through, about three and a half years into that seven-year period of time, the Antichrist uh, is revealed and he sits on the throne in the temple and says that he is God. And... Basically, people all fall away from God and they worship Antichrist instead of God. So this is going to happen during that seven years of time. But it hasn't happened, and therefore, rapture hasn't happened yet. And then Paul says in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So we know that Paul taught them about these things, about the end times and coming of the Lord and our gathering to him. And he says in verse 6, And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Paul says, For now there is something or someone who is restraining or stopping the Antichrist from doing his work. Now from this verse we can see that the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist has been at work all the time. We can say that even um, during Jesus' time, when the devil came and tempted Jesus Christ, that was in the spirit of Antichrist. That was against God, against Christ. You can even go backwards into the past uh, when Herod tried to kill all the babies and hence um, Jesus was the baby at the time. That was a kind of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. And you can even go back into the history of Israel where the devil for sure tried to wipe away the lineage of David because Christ would be born from the family of David. So if all the David's descendants are killed or die without having any offspring, then that prophecy wouldn't come true. So there were a few, few times when the, the lineage or the line of David's um, family was in danger. But by God's providence and miracle, God saved them. And we have the line of David, and that's where Jesus was born from. So there has been throughout the history... Um, the, the work of the Antichrist or the work of Antichrists, uh, many Antichrists in, in history. But the revealing of the Antichrist in the end, that is now restrained. He's restrained and because he's restrained, he may be revealed in his own time. He may be revealed not now, sometime in the future, in his own time. And let's look at verse 7 and following. We can come back to the restraining because it, um, it's mentioned um, again here. In verse 7, because he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is always already at work. Just as I told you, this mystery of lawlessness, mystery simply means something that was um, hidden now but will be revealed. The mystery of lawlessness, the work of the Antichrist is already at work. Only he who now restraints will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now you can see um, that he is with capital H referring to God or the Holy Spirit and until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, in other words, it's like the Holy Spirit is restraining the work of the Antichrist now. 
But the moment he steps back or steps away from that, he is simply allowing the Antichrist, the devil, to do his work. It is not as if um, that he is causing these evil works to go on, but he is merely um, letting loose of the restraint that he has had before. And because there's no more restraint now, the devil and the Antichrist can do their work um, to, to their heart's content, basically. And that's what's going to happen during the seven years of great tribulation. So this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It is only because he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. But that hasn't taken place just yet. And verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed. So when the restraint is removed, the lawless one, the son of perdition, or as we have seen uh, before, um, the, the, um, the man of sin, uh, the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, he will be finally revealed. So in verse 8, the lawless, lawless one will be revealed when the restraint is removed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now when the lawless one is revealed, it says the Lord will consume Basically, the Lord will destroy this lawless one. The Antichrist that will be revealed will be destroyed. In fact, we know that the Antichrist will be given only 42 months to rule. It's a relatively short time considering that the history of mankind has been going on for thousands of years. And after the short time, he says the Lord will consume and destroy him. How? Look at this. This is really fascinating because... It's not as if that God has to do something to destroy him. It seems as if from this text that the Antichrist will be destroyed by his own breath. The Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Because of Christ who is coming, um, it's, it's a little... You can debate whether his mouth is, is the mouth of Christ or, the, or his mouth is the mouth of the, the, the Antichrist. But whatever the, either case, the Antichrist will always be against Christ. And because he's against God, because of his work that is against God, who is basically uh, you know, non-destructible, you cannot win God, he will be destroyed because he's coming against God. And you can also say that because um, Christ comes and because of his mouth and his breath and his power, that power of Christ will destroy him and consume him. But either way, when Antichrist, well, Antichrist is the one who opposes God, comes against God, he will be destroyed because he comes against the Almighty God. So this Antichrist hasn't come yet, and therefore the rapture hasn't, happened, hasn't taken place. But when he comes... He'll be given a very brief time and he'll be destroyed and he'll be basically consumed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this will, this will all happen, he says, of his coming. To also make it a little clear, um, we talked about this as well, but at the beginning of the seven years of great tribulation, the Lord Jesus will come in the air. And that's when the church will be raptured up. But after the seven years, he'll come on earth with the saints. And... Um, they are sometimes referred to as his second coming, but we can say that he's coming in the air first and then he's coming on the earth the second. And also um, after that is millennium kingdom, but we can see that a lot of details are missing here. And the Lord Jesus Christ will basically carry out that white throne great judgment after the millennium kingdom. And at that judgment, basically the devil and, and Satan or the devil and his angels, his demons, and all these unbelieving people will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. That will be the final consummation and final destruction. So that's all going to happen when the Lord comes. So, if you look at verse 9, the coming, then the question is this, okay, the, the lawless one, the Antichrist hasn't come yet, but when he comes, how will we know that he is the one. We can even ask the question, was someone in the history like you know, Hitler or anyone else Antichrist? How do we know? 
Now, the answer is in verse 9 and following. It says in verse 9, Look, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. So this is a satanic working. And with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So it's not only some terrible, evil works that they might do, but these are supernatural works. These are miraculous signs and wonders. In fact, if you read Revelation, that he will cause at one time the fire to come down from heaven and even cause some statue, an idol, to speak. Now these are not just normal, ordinary, physical things, but these are extraordinary, non-physical, supernatural wonders. So when the lawless one comes, he will come with the working of Satan, and all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now we have to be thankful that Christians, as Christians, we have the truth. And by having the truth, we are assured that we can be in position of not being deceived, whatever that deception may be. Jesus once said in John chapter 8, the devil is the father of all lies or all liars. The devil invented the lie. You might recall in Genesis chapter 3, the devil said to Eve, if you eat this fruit, you will not die. You will be like God. That was the very first lie with which he deceived Eve and Adam and caused the humanity to fall into sin and face death. He is the inventor of lies. He deceives people and that's his normal course of work. And when, they, when he deceives people, look at this, then who are deceived? Not Christians. Not Christians, we, who, not Christians who have the truth, but people who perish, those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. The unsaved people, you can say very crudely, are the people who received false, um, false things or false information. In a sense, all unsaved people, especially those who have heard the gospel and rejected the gospel, those people have been deceived and they are being deceived. And they are deceived for eternal consequence, eternal hell. And this lie comes from the devil. The source of the lie is the devil. And the people who are victims, who fall to victims of these lies, are the people who reject the truth, those who have not believed the truth or the love of the truth. But as for you, Paul says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. If you have the truth, you can stand on the truth and not be deceived. And then verse 11 he says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Now this is another um, scripture that actually talks about the sovereignty of God. Um, you, might, um, you might remember Romans chapter 9 you know, about Esau and Jacob and um, they were twins but you know, they were even determined from before even they were born from the mother's womb that one will be accepted by God, one will be uh, denied by God. And that was all by God's sovereignty. Now here is another verse that talks about the sovereignty of God. Look at, his, look at this. He says this, God will send them strong delusion. You might say, well, it seems that God sent them strong delusion so that they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't believe. And that's why they are deceived. That's why they believe the lie, isn't it? Is it their fault? Isn't it God's uh, responsibility? Is, isn't God responsible for their deception or, or deceiving or delusion? You might say that. Well, that's not entirely untrue. But at the same time, he sends them strong delusion because they decided to, to receive the, the untruth uh, or the false teaching. Or they lie. They, they receive the lie. 
you can see that um, when their hearts turned away from God, and when they decided to believe the lies and reject the truth, then there is double um, penalty in a sense that God made them blind by the strong delusion so that they should believe the lie. It's like um, people who are born blind. They are born blind and they cannot see. Uh, sometimes um, they cannot see because um, they have some physical defect. Sometimes they may not see because God takes light away from them. It's almost like they are double um, deceived and, and blind because they chose to receive the lie and to believe the lie. And therefore, God indicts them with a punishment of strong delusion so that they believe the lie. It's almost like judicially they are also sentenced when they decide to um, go against God. So God sent them, God will send them strong delusion. And they believe the lie and they follow after this devil, Satan, that they all may be condemned which is a word used with eternal condemnation, hell, judgment, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. People who do not believe the truth have pleasure in unrighteousness. So if you put it all together, Paul is saying this in this paragraph. The end has not come yet. The, the rapture hasn't taken place yet because the Antichrist hasn't been revealed yet. So how do we know the Antichrist? Well, he says, when he comes, he comes with the power of Satan, working of Satan, powers and signs and lying wonders, and people will be deceived, and God will send them strong delusion. They will follow after Satan and believe his lies. It's almost like all these people on mass believe the devil and his lies, no matter how absurd that might be. And they believe this ludicrous lie, outrageous deception that takes people away from God and they have pleasure in unrighteousness and they did not believe the truth and they rather believe the lie so that they would be condemned and punished by God. And that hasn't taken place yet. So this is basically um, almost the whole world turning away from God and turning towards Satan and Satan's work. Now, during the tribulation, we know that some small um, number of people, um, compared to the world population, uh, will believe, 144,000 for that matter. And also, it seems that there are some great white cloud of Gentiles who believe as well. So yes, the work of salvation will still continue during the tribulation, whether it is for the Jewish people, 144,000, or the Gentiles who might be saved during that time. But vast majority of people in the world who go into the tribulation without being raptured because they haven't believed and become part of the church, they will believe the lies of the devil and they will go with Satan's deception or Antichrist's deception. And even though Thessalonian church was going through severe persecution, that was not what was happening in their time. People were still coming to Christ. Churches were still being planted. And churches were multiplying and growing number. And they were preaching the gospel. Clearly, this tribulation was not taking place at the time. Yes, they had tribulation. They had persecution. But it was not the great tribulation. The lawless one, the son of perdition, Antichrist, the falling away, man of sin is not revealed. Those things haven't, ha haven't happened yet. Now they have to happen first before the second coming of Christ on earth takes place. And now the Holy Spirit is restraining. So be at peace. Take comfort. Be encouraged. Persevere through this persecution. In a sense, we can see that the end is determined here. You can see that Satan will come, but he'll be consumed. He will be destroyed. 
We live in this history that has been determined in terms of its end and consummation. And we can see clearly through the Bible what will happen in the future and how this world will be. There is no long lasting or eternal lasting hope in this world because the world will be no more at some time in the future. There is nothing that we can hope for in this world. I mean, there is no true peace, for example. There is no eternal peace in this world. The world still goes on, but it is so fragile politically and environmentally, relationally, and we can see that we cannot really expect to find anything everlasting in this world. And we can see that the end is determined. Now, theologically, we talked about this also as well, so let me just share this with you. Uh, we, we think that the Bible teaches what we call premillennialism, or pre-tribulation and premillennialism. And that simply means that rapture will happen, and tribulation will come, and then the millennium kingdom will come, and even that millennium kingdom will be no more, and then the world will go into eternal heaven and eternal hell. We believe that. And that teaching teaches us that in the future, the world will basically be uh, worse than this. It gets worse and worse, and it'll be uh, basically disintegrated, um, and the Lord will judge this world, and, and that's what we read also here in kind of summary fashion. And because of that, there is no true hope in this world, and our hope is fixed in, in eternal heaven. And because we know the end, we know that our work as Christians is not so much to fix this world as much, but it is to work for the expansion of the kingdom of God, to bring more people into the kingdom of God. And that is, we believe, the gist of Christians' work, um, you know, whether it's missions or evangelism. The end is determined. And that gives us assurance. And that, give, that gave them, the Thessalonian church, assurance and comfort. Now, putting it all together, you know, we need to actually make some sense of this um, in our life. Now, we believe in God who has determined the end. If he has determined the end for this world, world history, then surely he who is omniscient and almighty, omnipotent, has the knowledge of our future. In other words, God has determined your future, just as he has determined the future of the world. We do not know that. You do not know that. You do not know how your life will end. You do not know how your life will turn out in the future. But does God know? Of course he knows. Not only that, he has determined your future. And because God has the knowledge and determination of the future of your life, we who believe in that God can have assurance in our hearts as we live our life in the present time. Think about this. What are you going through now? And how is your life now? You might be going through some difficult times. You might be going through some joyous times, uh, good times. Whatever you're going through, sometimes you know, we think in our life um, at some stages, you know, this is too hard and, and what's going to happen? I don't see the future. You may not know the future. You may not know the, the end, but God knows the end. And that's the God whom we trust and believe. We trust that God, who knows and determined your future, just as he knows the future of this world, he knows every single person's future with his omniscience. So this letter, Second Thessalonians, was not simply giving the church comfort. Of course it was doing that. But I'm sure that this letter also gave comfort and peace to individual Christians in the church. And of course, for every Christian who reads this text, this letter, and understands it, has the same assurance and comfort and peace in his or her heart. 
And I pray that will be the case for us. It gives us comfort. It gives us reassurance. It gives us the guiding principle. You don't live your life for the future. You live your life for the God who has determined your future. And there's a difference, right? Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us assurance and comfort and peace in our heart. As we listened to this letter that was written to the church in Thessalonica, we put ourselves into their shoes, their situation. It may be different, it may not be exactly the same. They were going through some severe persecution. And that was great tribulation for them, lots of suffering for them. And we go through some suffering, it, it's not the same kind of suffering, Lord, we know that. But at the same time, we go through some difficulties and sufferings and sometimes our hearts may be downtrodden. Our outlook may be very grim that we may be filled with sorrow at times. But just as this text would have given them assurance and comfort and encouragement, we trust that this has given us and will give us that same assurance and comfort in our hearts as we remember these things. Lord, help us so that we would not be deceived by anything that is contrary to what the Bible says. We pray also that we will remember what has been taught to us so that we would have the knowledge of the truth, the everlasting truth, so that we can always stand in the truth and live our life for you who is everlasting, who is always true, because we know that you know the future and we trust that you have determined the future and we need to depend on you and cling on to you who has the control of not only the history of this world but the history of individual, every person in this world. And we are especially blessed because we are Christians, we are your children, we are your beloved ones. So we can trust in you all the more and we thank you for this immense privilege. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.